In a country that ignores the theatre, she deliberately chose to be a stage actress, and her theatrical company is today considered one of the finest in the land. So why should she do it? And far more importantly, what is she herself like? Well, let's see if we find out as I introduce you to the remarkable Nadira Babur. Welcome to the program, Nadira. Thank you, Gareth. Thank In you fact, so the much. truth is that Nadira is not your original name. The name you were actually given is quite different, isn't it? Yes. My original name was uh, Shamim. Shamim was Seher, to be exact. But then somewhere down the time, I think my parents changed my name and it became Nadira. In fact, you have unusual parents, some would say extremely, exceptionally unusual parents. Tell me about them. They were remarkable people, I'm told. Yes. Yes, they were. Very nice, very lovely human beings. And I'm really proud to be their daughter. It's destiny that I was born to them. And whatever I have in my personality today is due to their upbringing and their values and their principles. Your father was the son of a knight who went to Oxford and gave it all up to become a communist, wasn't that right? Yes, he was one of the founder members of the Communist Party and that he remained till he died. He was a party holder, card party holder. So was my mother. She was not a she didn't have a card of the party, but then she supported him all the way. And she wrote short stories as well. She was a very accomplished author, wasn't she? She is one of the finest Urdu short story writers of my country and also a teacher. She taught uh, Urdu language in Lucknow University for 22 years. There's an interesting story that's told. Confirm it for me. Is it the case that your father, in fact, was in Pakistan shortly after you were born in jail for eight years? Yes. Even before uh, I was born, he was uh, sent to Pakistan. The party sent him in the Ravel Pindi conspiracy case to throw the government there and uh, form a communist government there. And uh, unfortunately, they were arrested. He was along with Faiz Ahmad Faiz and Mia Afta Kharuddin and a whole lot of them. And uh, there was a verdict that they were all sentenced for life imprisonment. But then he was released on Pandit Nehru's insistence and uh, he came back after almost like, I think, eight years. So you saw your father for the first time when you were eight years old? Yes, not eight, I was seven. Yes, almost eight. <laughs> and uh, it was December. I still remember early morning his train was expected on Lucknow station and we were all woken up. It was winter and we all got dressed up with three sisters and my mother and we went to the station and this whole big crowd was there to receive my father. All my party comrades were there, his friends were there, there were thousands of people on the station <clears throat> and I had never seen my father and I was, we, all four of us, my three sisters and my mother were standing together on the platform and I kept asking my mother that, who's my father? Tell me who's my father. And suddenly I saw this huge man because my father was very tall. He was six feet something, two inches, I think. Very fair, very broad forehead. And suddenly saw this very fair, good looking man walking towards us and the crowd cheering for him. And he came and he took me in his arms. I still remember that moment when when you feel your father's arms around you, which I felt for the first time when I was, yes. It's an amazing thing. If you ask anyone, <coughs> when did you first see your father, they could never answer that question. And yet, that's a question that you know the answer to perfectly. Yes, <laughs> yes. You've often said in your interviews that your childhood, which you spelt in Lucknow, was perhaps the most cherished time of your life. What made it so idyllic? Because I think uh, we had so much in my childhood, and like it was such an unusual childhood. My father was not there, and my, you know, I always felt that my party, uh, the Communist Party people, the comrades, the poets, the writers who used to come to our house were just like a family, a big family. Our house was like an open house. And one of the rooms in our house were always left open from inside, and one door was open from outside. In the, mo in the night, my mother used to lock the door from inside. In the mornings, we used to see 
when we opened that one poet or somebody was always there and they had finished the bread which we used to keep in the night for them. So, that was a kind of atmosphere I grew in. I did not know that Kafi Sahab or Sardar Jafri or Majas Chacha or Majru Sultan Puri were not my real relatives. Uh, only when I grew up I knew and then I was brought up in this house which was uh, like a palace. There were about more than 100 trees in our house and I was like a monkey jumping from <laughs> one tree to the other tree. And it's lovely you should word, use that <coughs> word monkey to describe yourself because your sister says she was an incredible brat and she would beat up all the neighbor's <laughs> children. Yeah, I think she used, used, used the correct word for me. Yes, I was a brat. Were you always fighting with all the neighboring kids? Yes, and also with my sisters. And would I you win or would you simply get beaten up? <laughs> no, I was always winning. I used to beat up because I was pampered by my mother and more because my mother felt that my father is not there. She used to be a little kinder towards me in comparison to my other two sisters. My elder sister was of course like a mother to us and, and I was very naughty. There is something else your sisters have told us. They say, Tell her she may be the genius of the family today, but as a child she was also the family fool. <laughs> yes, I was. I was like a black sheep, Karan. I was really a black sheep. I was so bad in studies. I was. I never wanted to study. I didn't like studying. The only subject I enjoyed was um, history and uh, a little bit of English. And I didn't like any other subjects. Maths was like an enemy to me. I used to hate it and I was not willing to study and especially in the contrast of my elder two sisters who, who were so good, you know, their names used to come in newspapers and they were always in high percenters and you know, like 80 percent, 70 percent. So, in comparison, I always used to sneak out of the rooms when people started talking about results and percentage, I knew that this is the time to leave the room. Now, it was when the family moved to Delhi a lot later that you ended up joining the National School of Drama, but I'm told that in a strange way that actually happened almost by accident. Yes, that's true, you know, because my uh, family, there was a problem that because I got a third division in my BA also. So, no one would accept you. <laughs> So, uh, they didn't know, I mean, I also didn't know what should I do and uh, uh, the family was discussing the possibilities of putting me into uh, Delhi University for uh, uh, library science, to become a librarian and um, just by chance my father met Mr. Al-Kazi in some reception in the evening and he was his nodding acquaintance and uh, he just happened to mention about me and he suggested that why don't you put her in the school of drama. And my father said that my daughter had never done anything in theatre, she doesn't know anything about theatre. And he said, uh, that's okay, let her come, let what her What an see. interesting advertisement for the theatrical profession, she's not good for anything else, make an actress of her. <laughs> no. But you in fact, you didn't take <coughs> the NSD when you saw it the first time? You didn't like the place at all? No, I think that was more because I, though my parents were very progressive and highly educated and modern in the real sense, but I did come from a smaller town and I did come from a, you know, where uh, wearing a dupatta was necessary and it is still necessary for me, but uh, so, you didn't fit in immediately? Yes, I, it was a little odd for me and, uh, but then I kind of adjusted and started liking it after. At uh, what point did you suddenly discover that you didn't just like the NSD, but that theatre was your real love? I think uh, when I was casted in a play called Elephant Calf by um, Amal, Amal al -Nana. she was, uh, had come back from Germany and she was doing a play and she gave me a role of a barmaid and uh, I had to sell uh, alcohol to all these soldiers and uh, who had come in my bar and I had to dress and wear a, a very short skirt and a very low, um, low neck blouse 
and the very high makeup, too much makeup on my face and I was very embarrassed to wear that. I kept pulling my skirt and I kept, uh, you know, I was very embarrassed. But then I didn't know what I was doing. But when I finished that play and my next morning when I reached and everybody was telling me, you've got a very good review in the newspaper. And I still remember that I, uh, Mr. Alkazi was walking in the corridor and he looked at me and he said, so how many hearts have you stolen? I said, sir, she said, you haven't seen the newspaper? I said, no. And then apparently I came to know that in the newspaper, she said she, that she stole the hearts of the audience. And I was, I, I really didn't understand at that point that what was the thing which was nice in me and what, because I, I was so out of place in that play so uncomfortable in that show that I still don't believe, I still don't understand and what was which which was liked by the audience. So you made a profession out of the theatre just to find out why am I so good at it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's <coughs> almost 21 years since you founded your company Ekjot. Today of course it's considered the finest in the land, but when you actually founded it in 81, what were you hoping to achieve? I had not really... Uh, planned to achieve something. The only thing I planned to do was to do continuous regular theatre with absolute sincerity and honesty. That is all what I wanted and that is all what I want even now. So all the fame and success and recognition that's happened wasn't intended, it wasn't even sought after, it's almost accidental. I wouldn't say that. I think it's sheer hard work and labor and hard work of my whole team, which has to be mentioned at this point of my talking to you, Karan, because you know that theater is not one person, it's not painting, it's not, uh, you know, just you can't do it in alone in one room. It has to be supported with a group of people who trust you and have and believe in your They're talent. They're very important to you. Very important. And I'm really grateful to my group to having been so loyal, not to me, but to theatre, and for being there. So two years ago, when you won the Sagit Natak Academy Award, was that in a sense a very meaningful, emotionally mo powerful moment for you? Yes, I wouldn't be honest if I don't say that. But then I would also like to add that it's not this that I was working for this award. It's come my way, it's very nice, I'm happy, I'm grateful to the people who looked at my work at this point at least, because I know that there are, you know, there are recipients of Sangeet Natak Academy Awards who've been brought on in, on wheelchairs. So I'm happy that they've got, uh, you know, they look But the recognition that matters is the recognition from the audience. Yes. It's when the hands clap in the auditorium that the real tears come to your eyes. Yes. That's what... Uh, Gorky has written in his play, Lower Deaths, he says that the most uh, intoxicating thing for a theatre person is the sound of the applause in the audience. Now, there are, let's take a break there. I want to come back and talk a little bit more about yourself and a bit about the life you've led. We'll be back in a moment. Stay loyal. Welcome back. My guest is the famous theatre actress Nadira Babar. Nadira, in one of your interviews you said, nothing comes easy in life. How much of a struggle has it been? The struggle is still on, Karen. It's not over. It's, uh, I think anybody in our country trying to do good work has to keep struggling till it goes on. But uh, that doesn't make it difficult in the sense that uh, if you like your work, if you love your work and enjoy doing it, then it's a journey of happiness and fulfillment, even if it's a struggle. You call it a journey of happiness and fulfillment. I know you're in the process of writing your autobiography. Are you going to be completely truthful in it? To some extent. I cannot be, I cannot be 100 percent truthful and, and honest in it. There are sides of your life that you're determined to keep to yourself. Yes. One that the world sadly has come to find out a lot about is your marriage. You first met your husband Raj Babar in 75. He was still a student of the NSD, wasn't he? 
Uh, no, he had finished school. Just finished? Yes. He came to you with a whole group of others from his class asking you to direct his play. What did you say? I agreed and we uh, worked together. We did this production called Jasma Odhan, which was very, very successful. You were three years older and in fact in those days you were teaching. What attracted you to him, can I ask? Yes, you may ask. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was first of all a very good looking man and uh, very talented, extremely talented. In fact, uh, if you let me say that, I feel that the film industry has not even seen half of his talent or what he really is and what he has in himself. And the quality which really attracted me towards him and I still i am amazed by that, even now, is his capacity to work hard. He can work you know, like 20 hours every day, untiringly. You were, what, in your 20s when you still met him? Yes. Were you swept off your feet? No, no, I don't think that we were so young to be, we were not Romeo and Juliet, <laughs> we were not swept off our feet, but we decided to get married and we did. Sadly, after you got married and you moved to Bombay, he introduced a third person into the relationship, Smita Patil. I don't want to rake over unhappy memories, but as you know, the world knows about the marriage and the fact that it was a three-way relationship. Was it a very shattering experience for you? Yes, but then I don't want to go into the details of the bitterness and unhappiness because all of us in our personal lives have our own sorrows and joys and disappointments and disillusionments. And now that we are all happy and we have found happiness and harmony in our family, I don't want to talk about uh, things to create discord anywhere. I can understand. Your family says that she has a lot of strength in her and it's that strength that kept her going. Do you accept that description of yourself? I don't know if I have strength or not, but I the only thing which I feel about myself is that I'm a very happy person. I'm I'm a very cheerful person. I can laugh. I I love laughing. And even if the world wants to hear something else from me, they want to hear that I am someone who has sacrificed and tolerated and suffered. Maybe yes, all of us do. But then I am not a person to uh, you know, glorify my sufferings. And there are many other things and life is much more greater. It's very beautiful. And you believe in getting on with life? Definitely. Not giving in to emotion and... Yes, because I feel that life is much more, it's much more beautiful and greater to understand human greatness, to love, to do better things in life, not only for yourself and for family, for your whole society, for your work. You did a remarkable thing when after Smitha Patil's death you took your husband back. Was it inevitable that you would or was it in fact a difficult and agonizing decision? No, it wasn't difficult or any painful decision. I know that uh, I was uh, kind of put into that situation that people expected me to, uh, that uh, I should not have him back or the women's organizations have criticized me, called me doormat and you know that they have kind of disowned me. I don't care because for me my family and my children's happiness is more important. Why should I try and project a hypocrite image of my, uh, of my personality which I am not? I'm a happy person and I want the world to know that I'm a happy person. And you wanted him back? I wanted him back, of course. He's despite, my husband. Despite everything else? He's my best friend. And you I, love him still? Yes, I love him. He's, he's my biggest supporter in my theatre also. Everywhere in my life he's my strength. Even if some people don't want to listen to this and they want to, you know, why should I say something which would create a story for them to uh, get entertained and, you know, sympathize with me. I don't want all that because I like him, I respect him, I love him. And it doesn't matter that at one point he left you for Smitha because he no. still means a lot to you. Yes, definitely. 
your children during that difficult period, and you've often said this, were your strongest support. You've described them as your anchor. Was it difficult to have such young children, bring them up, and yet not turn them against their father? I don't know if uh, I should be saying this or not, but I think that a lot of the credit should go to the father also, because whatever happened, he never went away from us. You know, he was always there for the children. And uh, people close to us, our friends, they know the reality, that how close he was to the children all along. He never turned his back towards us. So it was not this that the entire credit should be given to me and I was kind of a martyr who was suffering and yet trying to uh, teach the children that, listen children, whatever has happened, you must love your father very much. It wasn't like that at all. It was a natural thing to happen and the children loved their father as any normal family, in any normal family, Indian family, children love. I also get the impression that perhaps the world slightly misunderstood Raj Babur, that the image that you and your children have is so different to the one that the trade magazines and the film magazines have conveyed. The film and the trade magazines sell on sensation and they have to give to the people something to, if, if I say that everything is okay and we are okay and our family is fine, there's nothing too exciting to read about. But they'll get very excited if I say, yes, I was, you know, like a Jesus Christ or something like that, that maybe they will. Are you a religious person? Is your faith important to you? I'm religious in the sense that I do believe in right and wrong. I believe in my values, my Indian values. I'm a very traditional person. And that is what I have taught my children to be, to be basically a good human being. In my family, my parents told us that you study all the religions. And if you feel that you need a religion in your life, then you choose whichever you like. So I'm not, I don't follow any rituals, me or my husband. But your faith gives you strength. Yes, absolutely. And it was your source of strength during the difficult days that you've lived through. Yes, and also my upbringing. And I mean, the faith I had in myself and my theatre and my children. Madhira Babar, a pleasure getting to know you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Love to be on your show. Thank you.